I think there's a lot of reasons why we can want sex, whether it's with new people, existing people, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, you can want more sexual connection because you want to feel sexy, because mm. you want to feel desirable, you want to feel attractive. Or it could straight up be, I'm just like really horny all the time and I need more orgasms. Or it could be, you know, I want to flirt with something. Like, like I think there's a lot of different reasons that can go into it. And sometimes if you pick apart and unpack those reasons, that can help give you more clues about what you might want to pursue. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're going to be answering questions submitted by our Patreon supporters about their relationships. If you would like to be able to submit your own questions, join our Patreon and look for our posts asking for submissions for these episodes. We get so many fantastic questions, and while we can't always answer all of them, we do see a lot of overlap and try to group them by themes. So hopefully, you know, everyone's able to get something out of this. And, and the fact that we see the same things come up often enough means there's other people out there with the same question. So these have been really cool to do and, and let us get into some of these details of some questions that that wouldn't really fit an entire episode long topic all by itself, but allows us to get into some of these things. So thank you so much to everyone who submitted your questions. And we're excited to keep doing this. Yeah, of course, we always have to give the disclaimer that you out there listening with this podcast right up in your little ears, you're the only person who fully knows yourself and your life and what's important to you. When we answer a question, we're basing it off of just what's written to us in usually a short question that is only a tiny little snapshot of what's going on in this person's life. So, of course, take any of our advice and opinions as suggestions or as an opportunity for some perspective. Ultimately, you make your own decisions about what's right for you. And also with a lot of these questions, there usually isn't one right answer. And on that note, let us begin with the first question. We need like a cool theme I know, song like a, for the exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's like Price is Right or something. Like, come on, <laughs> come down, on down with the first question. <laughs> yes. I All mean, right. I do love the idea of like building a whole TV studio set. Very Price is Right. Ooh. Like flashy, yeah. bright colors, people in the audience dressing up, looking silly. But it's all about love these that. very serious wow. relationship topics. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> and there's got to be a wheel, like a giant wheel that people spin for some reason. Like uh, uh-huh. how good of advice they're going to get. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> I guess they are kind of metaphorically spinning that wheel every time. So it's true <laughs> with the three of us. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Good luck. But we're going to try to give you some good advice here. Here is the first question. What are your tips for communicating to those you're in relationships with about having limited availability and managing expectations, whether those relationships are newly forming or already established? This is a good yeah, one. So can we norm can we normalize just going ahead and sending screenshots of your Google Calendar to potential <laughs> oh, do partners? You do that? Just I mean you could sure you could. You can take a screenshot of whatever and send it to somebody and just be like, just so you know, this is what my life looks like right now. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking today (laughs) about what I had to do. Like I woke up early to go to the dentist and then I recorded, I helped a friend record an audition and then I came home and am about to record four episodes of this podcast. (laughs) So I was like, yeah, that's a pretty big day. I think that's going to take me all the way up until almost (laughs) bedtime. Um, So yeah, I, I think on those days with my partner, he sort of knows, yeah, okay, this is going to be a big day for Emily. So in Mm -hmm. terms of emotional availability, it may be lessened. And that is, you know, knowledge over years and years of doing stuff like this and having really, really big days. But I think it's perfectly okay to tell somebody, hey, 
I, I may be less responsive today to your texts. I may not be able to take a phone call. I may be shorter in my answers to you just simply because I have such a limited availability and such a limited amount of time today. And that's perfectly OK. Communication is what we talk about on this show. I think it's occurring to me that that this is a little bit tricky because of the fact that often this is a a variable thing, as in for some people, they go through periods of life, whether it could be a few weeks to a few years where it's like, I don't have a ton of bandwidth, right? But maybe that's going to change. And so I do think it is hard to show up to a first date, metaphorically, and to be like, this is exactly the amount of time that I have Hmm. for developing this type of relationship, take it or leave it. Be, and so I do think that, yeah, like you're saying, Emily, I think this is something that requires kind of constant communication around Definitely. because it's really easy to fall into routine. It's really easy for there to be assumptions. And so it's this is probably going to be a conversation that happens multiple times, especially in an established relationship. Right. And I think other one other thing that's important to point out here is that we've talked about, you know, being busy and like, look how much is on my calendar. I'm so busy. But something we have talked about in the past, but maybe haven't addressed as much recently is that there's also a lot of importance to just because I have free time doesn't necessarily mean it needs to go to all my partners. That's fair. That is the danger of sharing your Mm -hmm. Google calendar. Exactly. It's like, aha, I see you have this, you know, three hour (laughs) slot on, you know, Wednesday evening. That's mine now. No, that's like sometimes going to be necessary for me to recover from all of the other things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think this one's interesting too, because it says, you know, whether those are newly forming or established. And I do think the way you communicate this is quite different in those two scenarios, right? So with a newly established relationship, that's, that's an interesting question, but it's also one that, at least in my experience, does tend to come up in conversation kind of early on. It's like, well, you know, maybe after that first date, it's like, well, when do we want to see each other again? Or, you know, what, what would be, when would be a good time? It kind of comes up organically of like, here's the thing, you know, I, I really value my alone time and I'm also fairly busy, maybe took on a new project at work or I just moved or, you know, whatever it is. So I've got a lot of stuff going on and also need my own time as well. What if we, you know, just aimed for once a week or once every other week or, you know, kind of whatever, or twice a week, whatever feels good to you as just a ballpark to kind of set that expectation. I have found that to be really helpful for myself and specifically what I've had to learn for myself is to state that my availability is much less than I want to tell them it is in the moment, Hmm. right? Because I'm excited about this new person. And so I have so many times gotten myself into this situation where it's like, I just want to see them because I'm excited and there's NRE. And so we're seeing each other three, four times a week. And then, you know, when another partner comes into town or work gets a little busier or just that NRE starts to wane a little bit, or I just start to get tired because I'm not sleeping enough, (laughs) whatever it is, then I have to back off on that. And that's, that can be a harder conversation. Uh, it's still, still doable and you can still be clear about, Hey, you know, I've been really excited to spend time with you, but also like, I do really need more time for myself and more time to recover. So I need to set something like this and then to actually stick to that. Even when you do have that extra surprise time, that's at least something I've learned for myself for, for those kind of newer relationships. And I guess that could apply in existing ones too, but I tend to run into that problem more with newer ones. Yeah. And I think when it comes to new relationships, there's a tricky balance between being upfront like that and very clear of right now I can probably really only see someone once a month or once a week or whatever it is. Between that and I think sort of the shadow side of that can be trying to fit someone into a very particular shape, mm. you know, and trying like that's something I've always really struggled with is like, how do you how do you be honest about this is the space that in my life that I have for this right now versus setting up this weird expectation of like, this is a particular shape and you have to fit into this if you're going to work. And there's no ands, ifs or buts about it. And there's no negotiation. It's not going to change. You just need to fit that. And if you don't fit that perfectly, then you're out of here. You know, it it feels feels like kind of trying to find a middle path there. That's why I think that it's like, 
you're going to be coming back to this conversation as conditions hmm. change and as expectations change also, right? Because sometimes you may be surprised, like you catch some deep feelings for someone and you find, oh, actually, maybe we're really compatible. And you realize your priorities shift a little bit. Maybe I want to open up a little more time for this person or opposite. <laughs> maybe it's <laughs> right. uh, this relationship wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. And so, you know, maybe I don't want to be trying to prioritize this much time, of course, doing your best to ethically and compassionately communicate that to folks. But, but yeah, I think that's the thing is just knowing that like you may need to expand yourself and be ready for some, for some nuance and some seeking some balance with that. Yeah. And then I think like Emily kind of said, for those established ones, it is more about having some way to more honestly communicate about that, even if it is asking for time for yourself, which I know for a lot of people in established relationships is hard to do because that can also feel like, well, wait, you're taking time away from me after all this time. What's, what's the matter? Is this the beginning of the end? You know, it, it leads to some of that kind of fearful thoughts. Uh, so that can be a hard thing when you do realize that, but that's why doing something like radar of having like a regular container of like, we're going to talk about this kind of serious stuff here, not when it's because I'm exhausted and freaking out, but just because we had this time scheduled. So now we're going to talk about this, that that can help to, to like communicate as explicitly and clearly and compassionately as possible. Yeah. My partner and I might do like one night every few weeks or something where we're like, okay, instead of sitting on the couch and watching TV and eating like we usually do, We'll like have the night to ourselves to do our own thing, play our own video games or whatever, catch up on stuff if we want. And that's really beneficial as well. So don't yeah. forget about yourself because I think yeah. a lot of people are like, I have to fill every second of every day. I know I'm right like for my partners. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Especially if, if, if <laughs> I feel like this happens with hinges a lot, if you're running around feeling like no one is happy with the amount of time that they're getting from mm. you and you feel this pressure to be like every free time I have, I have to give it to somebody. That's probably a red flag that something something's got to give something's got to shift. Mm. Are we ready to move along to the next question? Let's do it. Yeah. What do you do if you've figured out you're polysaturated, but are still <laughs> lacking sexual connection that you want? And have never been good at friends with benefits before. I believe this was your inspiration for the title of this episode, Jace, about polysaturated but still thirsty. Yes, I, I love that title so much. <laughs> <laughs> I it, The first thing that came to mind, and this might be controversial, but I was thinking like, what if you went to dungeons or sex clubs or kink clubs or something along those lines where it's a specified like place for you to do and engage in these things, but you're not necessarily going to be engaging further with someone in a romantic way or where you have partners that'll continue over time, but just where you can kind of enjoy yourself for the evening or multiple evenings or something along those lines. I don't know. What do you two no, think? That's, it's definitely an interesting one. I think that the challenge with it is you have to have something like that around mm -hmm. a lot of them. You have to be a member of it. And then third is like, you have to be into that sort of aesthetic and also that way of interacting with people, which True. for some people is like awesome, a great way to get that need met. Uh, and for other people it's just not, not the right fit or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think something else just to, <laughs> to give another possibility of kind of a different way of approaching this is something like, if seeing if in your area there's a cuddle party group mm. or some other kind of touch based that's not sexual because it's possible that that also might might be part of what that need is about is is kind of like touch and intimacy but not sexual necessarily could be i'm not saying that's 100% for sure but i do like to always say huh maybe i'm just needing more touch right now before i think that it has to be this just as another option Actually, yeah, that's a good path of questioning, I think, is, you know, you can start with looking at when you feel like that sense of lack or feeling like that longing for more sexual connection or variety or whatever it is that you can, I think, dive down into, well, where is that coming from? You know, because I think there's a lot of reasons why we can want sex, whether it's with new people, existing people, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you can want more sexual connection because you want to feel sexy. 
because mm. you want to feel desirable. You want to feel attractive. Or it could straight up be, I'm just like really horny all the time and I need more orgasms. Or it could be, you know, I want to flirt with something. Like, like I think there's a lot of different reasons that can go into it. And sometimes if you pick apart and unpack those reasons, that can help give you more clues about what you might want to pursue. And it could be things in your existing relationships, right? You know, because if the whole point here is that you're polysaturated and don't have a ton of time and energy to devote to trying to connect with someone new, that yeah. sometimes if you actually get down below the surface about what's underneath this craving and this longing, it can help spark some other ideas about how you might scratch that itch that maybe doesn't involve having to go to casual sex or acquire more partners or things like that. I am interested in this part, like the second part of the question saying that they've never been good at friends with benefits before. And I wonder what, you know, what there is to unpack there. Is it because friends with benefits turn into a relationship or, yeah, it, it they have a hard time mm -hmm. maintaining it or they have a hard time finding it? I, you know, I think of all the kind of activities and stuff that I do in my day, um, and how it might be easy to find people in that respect. But I, I do wonder what's going on there. And if that's a solution, if one were to get better at that, I don't know. Yeah, well, I think I've never been good at it either. Mm. And but I think part of that is we do put a lot of assumptions and there's a particular narrative around friends with benefits. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think it's often quite a negative uh what i don't want to say narrative again necessarily but but i just think there's a lot of assumption around ooh if it's a friend with ben friends with benefits that's going to mean yeah we hook up and have cool sex but we're not going to be affectionate with each other maybe it's going to be awkward maybe like some one person's going to get feelings and the other person's not mm -hmm. going to reciprocate and then it's going to be awkward you know and so yes that definitely can happen with a lot of friends with benefits relationships but it also doesn't have to be that way and I, I really, I have like, I have many missions in life. Oh yeah. <laughs> one of my side <laughs> missions in life <laughs> is encouraging people to be courageous in rewriting some of these scripts. If you're mm. listening to this podcast, you probably already have a seed of this in you to be, you know, a little subversive in your relationship choices, but it's things like, if you have a casual friends with benefits relationship and you also want like affection and kindness to be a part of that, it can be a part of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can really explicitly lay out the things that you want in this particular connection. Or if it's, I, I really want to like have sex once a month and would rather just not have to text anybody an additional person for a month. And so I would love it if like we just have minimal communication, right? You know, you can be granular in talking about the things that you want and expect. Not everybody's going to go for it, but some people are really going to go for it. And I think it's just all about, you know, you can spend some time thinking about how has this gone wrong in the past? Why have I not enjoyed, you know, creating a friends with benefits relationship before? And like, you do have a certain amount of power in being able to change the shape of that, or at least you know, communicate to people how you want the shape of this relationship to look. So that's a yeah. uh, join the mission. <laughs> right. And and I do think that that's something that um, kind of gets into this too, is that I think there is some, and maybe I'm just speaking from, from my own experience with this, but the struggles I've had with friends with benefits comes from a lot of like guilt and shame I have about even hmm. wanting that. Or that, you know, that that would be an acceptable thing for me to pursue or to want. I know that's something I've, I've struggled with personally. And for me, something that's really helped with that is when it's been able to grow out of a friendship with someone who I would say was maybe more sex positive than me. So they're able to kind of like help make it clear that this is okay and this is cool and this is something that, that they like too and this is good for everybody. Um, that, and, and you know, that's easier said than done to find those kinds of relationships. So this isn't something like, ironically, I think it's harder to find a good friends with benefits than it is to find someone to date as a potential, a, a potential serious partner, just because I think, stance. 
I think it's easier to find because we're all trained to say, oh, well, you're looking to date. There's apps for that. Mm. Those are acceptable to use. So you go on those and you do that. Or you ask someone out on a date and everyone kind of, even if we have different impressions of what this really means, everyone kind of has a script for like, ah, I asked you on a date. You said, yes, we're evaluating if we're interested in each other. And sure. it's going to look like somewhere in the neighborhood of dating in this way. Right. Whereas with the friends with benefits, we just don't have the like infrastructure and the encouragement and all of that, unless you have a really awesome sex positive friend group, in which case maybe you have some more of that. But that is sometimes a, a little hard to find if you're not already in that. So I guess I don't say that to be discouraging, but more just to to acknowledge like we say that as, as if it's just, oh, you know, just start asking people if they want these things the same as you do. There's kind of a preliminary, that. Yeah. right. Yeah, it's sort of a preliminary true. step of trying to f connect with some community in your area that is more sex positive. Maybe finding if there is a sex positive, you know, group in your area through, you know, through meetup or something like that, that actually does in-person meetups, ideally one that also does trainings and education as part of what they do. It's not just mm. like a cocktails and hookup kind of thing, but one that's like, we also do courses and classes and things like that at least from my experience, tends to attract a crowd who is more serious about this. And, um, and I think that also might be helpful just as a way to get yourself more familiar with people who can talk about sex in these type of relationship in a way that's, I guess, more matter of fact and has a little bit less of that baggage that I think almost all of us come in with. And that could also be a helpful way just for yourself too, in addition to hopefully finding those types of relationships. All right. And now for our next question, this one is, is it normal slash healthy to feel homesick for an existing partner when out on dates with new people? And then for some context, how do you work on that? I'm worried I don't allow myself to feel open to other connections, maybe due to past relationships slash abuse, maybe due to some unworked through compulsive monogamy. I've been in this world for about seven years. I think they mean the polyamory world, <laughs> but I like the idea of I've been in this world for only this seven whole years world. Yeah. Uh, and still haven't had two concurrent fully fledged romantic relationships. So that's some, some context. But the main question is, is it normal or healthy to feel homesick for an existing partner when out on dates with new people? Definitely normal and healthy. Yeah, it's understandable. Super, yes, 100%. Yeah. I do, I guess immediately I would maybe look at overall, is it something that you want? Is polyamory something that you're interested in? Just simply because those things are coming up. And then perhaps scale back from there and and kind of look at the bigger picture, look at the things that have led up to this. And in terms of opening yourself to new people, I mean, to me, often I would go into first dates just as I really enjoy getting to know new people. And I'm interested maybe not in putting so much pressure on the date itself mm. so that it's more like I'm just enjoying time with per potentially a new friend and that may turn into a romantic or sexual relationship but with that i don't know i mean when i hmm. see friends i don't necessarily always have as much homesickness for my partner or for my friends like the two of you that i've known forever just simply because i'm i'm excited about getting to know this new person I guess I would I would say if there's any way for you to take the pressure off a situation, um, but in terms of feeling homesick or or sad about you know oh I'm not with the one I love at home that's completely understandable totally normal yeah and I think you can look at that on the one hand it can just be oh my god like I really am so happy with my existing partner or partners, mm -hmm. you know, this doesn't necessarily have to be just, there's just one partner that I miss and feel homesick for. It can be multiple partners. Right. And mm -hmm. first of all, I think that's something to celebrate, right? There's so many people who are just like, so over their partners <laughs> when they go on a first date with somebody Gosh. else, Yeah. but you know, yeah, something to celebrate, right. That, you know, even when you're here presented with like something new and tasty and shiny, mm. you still miss and think about your other partners. Like that's great. And also, 
on the on an, on another side can be it's less about ooh i'm i'm just like miss my partner so much and it can just be about i'm scared of the unknown and yeah. i'm scared of breaking routine and i'm scared of going through the discomfort of taking a risk with someone new and not to say that that's a problem i think that's very normal but i do know that sometimes you know our routine is comfortable and Going on a date can be uncomfortable sometimes, you know, <laughs> having to think about, oh, I've got to open up to this person and I've got to try to evaluate who they are and I've got to talk about my sordid past and I've got to figure out how good they are at communication or whatever it is. That can feel like a whole pain in the ass compared to I could just be at home with my partner or partners just like playing video games and having a mm. good time. So, yeah, I think you can examine that of what's really here is there some just sort of fear of the unknown or fear of being vulnerable um and then i think also you know this doesn't even necessarily have to reach that level of is polyamory for me or not it's just like are you happy Mm. (laughs) you know even though it's been seven years in this world and you haven't had two concurrent fully fledged romantic relationships like that's okay you know, if you still feel happy and relatively peaceful and content, maybe that's how it's always going to be for the rest of your life. And like, that would be okay. And personally, I mean, I would give you the polyamory seal of approval, but I'm (laughs) not on the board of directors of confirming who gets to take the polyamory label or not. So, but I mean, in my own belief system, I'm like, yeah, you're still polyamorous. Doesn't Mm. matter. You know, I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Yeah, I guess just the thing I wanted to add to this, kind of like what Dedeker was just saying, is that there's also the possibility that you just you haven't connected with anyone or really been ready for that. Sure. And that it might not mm-hmm. have anything to do with just, oh, I'm just so comfortable in this or don't really need any other partners, but it could also be maybe just the way you've been meeting them just doesn't work for you. Maybe... Hmm kind of to go back to the previous question, maybe there's something about connecting with a community that you can kind of more organically form those relationships instead of the kind of more prescribed first date type vibe. And then of course, on the other hand, there could be some, you know, there could be some stuff holding you back. There could be some codependency there. There could be some things of just like, I don't know how to have an identity outside of my partner, which is totally normal and encouraged by our society, really. Um, But I mean, yeah, be gentle with yourself, though. It's not like, oh, I'm doing it wrong or or there's something wrong with me. But it could be taking those steps of just giving yourself some more alone time first. Hmm. Like, Take the time you're spending on dates right now and be like, I'm going to do something by myself, not with my partner. It's a good idea. Ideally, you know, with friends or something, but like, I want to have my own identity and really get comfortable with that first and then maybe see if I can use some of that time and energy toward dating and, and see if there's something there. Cause that is, it, it's just that type of codependency is so, so encouraged and praised in our, you know, Western society monogamy way of thinking about things, that whole soulmate idea. Um, so just to be aware of that and to kind of cut yourself some slack too, right. That, that you're not failing, but that there might be something there and that you could, work on exploring that and seeing if you can can escape some of that grip. Before we go on to more questions from our patrons, we are going to take a little bit of time to talk to you about some of our sponsors for this episode. These sponsors really help us to bring all of this information out there to you for free. It also helps us to pay the people who we work with who are so wonderful and we so appreciate. So if you can take some time to listen, we would really appreciate it and check them out if there's anything that's interesting to you. And we're back. All righty. This next one is really an interesting question. I'm very excited to hear what the two of you have to say. The question is, when, if ever, do you break up on behalf of a miserable partner who has made it clear that they do not like some aspect of your relationship that is not changing and they've agreed to that? Assuming you personally are otherwise content in the relationship, perhaps aside from the processing of their discontent. Okay, let's start by just kind of unpacking all the pieces of this. Yeah. So, so you're dating someone and there's something about your relationship that they don't like, but that they've agreed to date you anyway. 
I'm, you know, this could be non, yeah, non-monogamy. It is, could be yeah. your availability. It could be another partner of yours. It could be, I don't know what. That Just could be using that it's, the that word it's... miserable is really intense to me. I'm like, whoa, like, is that your yeah. projection of what they're oh. going through? If, yeah. Are they saying? That's, also been, that's been leveled at me also. Well, sure. Yeah. Things have some complicated emotions. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like, wait a minute, you know, let's, let's stop first and ask the question, have they said they're miserable? Is this like mm. a fact or is it just your interpretation of what's going on? And Dedeker, you talk a lot, and we've talked about this in our book, about problems that are unsolvable. Mm -hmm. And that Mm -hmm. that's simply just something that most, if not all, relationships go through. There are just going to be unsolvable problems. And I think the question is whether or not those unsolvable problems become such an issue that it's going to damage the relationship irreparably, or if it's something that you can work through and ultimately still stay together. Yes. And, and again, like you said, we don't have a ton of context about how this person knows their partner is miserable. I would want to mm-hmm. drill down into, was this a particular conversation? Is this something in their behavior? It, you know, like there's so many different ways that this question asker may be getting this message. Ultimately, though, I I think it is tricky because it's like you're not the one who dictates whether or not your partner is miserable to the point where this is not a good relationship for them. And I I get it. I feel like I've been on both sides of this where you can feel that way. And and I'm sure that the question asker probably just wants to be a compassionate, ethical person, right? I'm willing to bet that if their partner seems like they're miserable, it probably causes a certain amount of guilt for this person and they don't want to be hurting their partner. And so, yes, that is uncomfortable. And also just going to someone and saying, you're too miserable for this relationship. So I'm prescribing to you Mm -hmm. as your relationship doctor, you need to not be in this relationship. So be gone with you. Like, no, that doesn't sit particularly well with me. Yeah, it just doesn't go over well. It's not a good foundation for having that type of conversation. I think for the question asker, if you think it's best for the relationship to end like you feel like this is not really good for either of us that's on you to express those things and make it about you don't make it about them you know so it's like either you need to like make some requests about the way you want to see the relationship change or you need to communicate those things to your partner or you need to say like I need to take myself out of this and it's not about oh you're so miserable so I need to take myself out and so if you were just less miserable then I'd be here you know like it it starts to get <sighs> kind of yeah. messy that's uh, that's so that's so hard because you you've really hit on it right it's that if we're just taking this at at face value and say like should you break up with someone because they're miserable, but they say they're okay being in the relationship, I would say, well, no, that's not trusting them to make their own decisions. And yeah, that's, this is an you autonomous know, person. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I do think that, because I've been in this situation too, where it's like, mm. yeah, it sucks to be in a relationship where you're constantly feeling bad because the person you're with is expressing how they're unhappy. I'm not even yeah. going to say miserable, even just unhappy about something about you, right? Something about your relationship. And that's part of you. That's part of what you're, you're here for and able to do. And like, that sucks. And I think that breaking up with someone because you're miserable and unhappy because of how upset they seem to be about your relationship, I think is super valid. That also sucks as a message to deliver because it does kind of end up coming across, like Dedeker said, of, Mm. I want to break up with you because you're so miserable and it sucks to be with you. Right? Like that is a bummer, even if it is kind of the truth. Well, at the end of the day, the only person that you can change or whose emotions you are responsible for are your own, I think. And if you find that this relationship is not working out because of whatever perception is happening or whatever truth is happening, and that's something that you simply don't want to be a part of anymore, then I think it is okay to say, okay, like clearly something is not working in this relationship. We have discussed the things that are not going in the direction that 
we each want, like, you're in this direction, I'm in this direction, and I think it's okay to break up at that point. But not, like, saying, yeah, you're miserable, so bye. <laughs> I think that's a tough, <laughs> yeah. tough thing to hear and tough thing to say and not okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry that you're having to go through this question asker. Yeah. I really wish that we can we encourage people to do those kind of fun sleepless in Seattle style sign offs. You oh. know, I want someone to be able to address like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, partner of a miserable partner mm. in Mary Maryland. That's a oh, state. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Mary, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I like that's a fun idea. We should we should start doing that. Yeah. Yeah. That's Maybe good. when we start posting, making these posts, we can tell people to come up with a fun, a fun little sign off, fun for cheeky yourself. little sign off. I yeah. like that. Miserable yeah. in Maryland. Yeah, I like that. No. <laughs> That's sad, <laughs> but no. sympathetically right, miserable in Cincinnati. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, I like that. Good, okay, good. Yeah. All right, next question. My partner recently began dating someone we have both been friends with for several months. I've really appreciated their friendship so far and would like to keep it going. However, I'm not usually open to kitchen table style polyamory and prefer to not interact with my metamors very often. How do I tackle maintaining a meaningful, established friendship while respecting my own boundaries? Okay, I have, a, I have questions, which I know I will not get answers to, but I'm going to ask them anyway. <laughs> okay. So when you say not open to kitchen table style polyamory i'm kind of like well why? why like what what does that mm. mean right I, I'm, a, I'm a little just sort of questioning putting and, and this I, preference sorry. onto a label of a thing but i do think there's some there's interesting stuff here right of like well what is it about that that you tend to not like why is that rather than just mm, this is going to look like this thing that i say i don't do and i don't think that's necessarily what the question asker is getting at but that kind of jumped out to me from the way the question was phrased I just wanted to jump in and just put some uh, some padding around Jace's question, just to say that we affirm if you're not into kitchen st table polyamory, that's totally okay. Oh, sure. I just didn't want sure, Jace sure, to come sure. across as, why, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's not really a style of polyamory that I've done very much either. So I'm not saying like, this is the way you should do it, or this is best at all. Um, most of my life tends to be more of a parallel Hmm. polyamory style. And, you know, sometimes we'll all hang out. It's not like we're hiding from each other, but I'm also not like, I like having my space. I don't really want everyone all up living at my kitchen table all the time. Right. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fine. So yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That's not what I mean, but I, I do mean this is already your friend. Yeah. And so I, if before it's like, well, I just don't really want to like add more people into my life in a more involved way than I already have. So I don't really want to get super close with my metamors. Like I'm cool over here, but like this already is your friend. So I'm like, well, then it, then it can't be that problem unless it's cause we're falling into this label of ah, kitchen table is not a thing I do. This starts to look like that. That's a problem. Again, I know I'm, I'm jumping on this and it's probably not where the question asker is coming from, but, but that does, did jump out to me from the question. Then the second part of it there says, and I prefer not to interact with my metamors very often. So again, kind of going with the same thing. I'm like, again, is that because of the metamors of just sort of like, I don't really want to like try to develop these new hangout friendships where our only thing in common is the fact that we're dating the same person. Cause I get mm. that. But again, this person you're already friends with, if it's that I feel weird and don't know how to navigate being with a partner while they're with someone else that they're also affectionate with, then, okay, then we have something to start with. It's like, okay, if that's actually the issue, and it very well might be, that is something to navigate. And hopefully, because this person's already a friend, you have some open communication that you could do. I know you've only been friends for a few months now, but to be able to talk about some of that of like, hey, I think it'd be cool for us all to hang out together. I'm still trying to figure out how to get comfortable with maybe you two being affectionate and mm -hmm. also like how much I can be affectionate with my partner. Like, I know that's usually where I'm more uncomfortable is knowing how affectionate I can be than how affectionate my metamors are. It's kind of that, like, well, I don't want to make someone feel weird. I don't want to make someone feel bad or like feel like I'm being too possessive or, or something of this partner. So, so anyway, but I do think those are conversations that if you can get a little bit clearer on which parts are challenging can help have more productive conversations about those specifically 
And I think it's totally fine to say like, hey, I I think you're an awesome person and an awesome friend. And I just prefer keeping our friendship separate from the relationship that the two of you are having. I think like I would like to have the relationship that you and I have stay its own thing and not have to get in a situation where maybe we're talking about the challenges of that relationship or, you know, talking about what the what kind of person they are as a partner or something along those lines. I think it's okay to set those kind of boundaries if that is something that you want. But also potentially be open, like Jay said, to the possibility that more of a kitchen table style isn't going to be that awful as as challenging as you think it's going to be with somebody who's already established it's just occurring to me i wonder if one of the concerns is well i like this person they're my friend so i'm okay with them being around in a something that looks like kitchen table polyamory but if i'm okay with that then do i have to be okay with all metamors from Mm. here on out into the future also being at my kitchen table like i mean Mm -hmm. again don't have the context here but that's what just occurred to me and so I guess just to address that, if that's the case, that like, I don't know, I think that's okay. You know, it could be like, oh yeah, this is a person who's already my friend. And so I'm okay with them being around and maybe us, uh, you know, having also this kind of separate, like little metamorph polycule dynamic, but I'm not really open to that with strangers or people that I don't know, you know, I think that's yeah. all right. No, I mean, that's a, that's no. an interesting clarification to make. It's like, if I have some kind of relationship with this person, I'm cool with it. And if it's just randos, it's like, eh, I'd just rather not spend my energy on that. That makes sense. Sure. I get that. Yeah. And then the last part of this is just how do I tackle maintaining a meaningful established friendship while respecting my own boundaries? Um, I, you know, question boundaries a little bit of like, which parts are really the boundaries. Cause I'd say kitchen table polyamory. Like I don't do that. That's not, it's not really a, boundary like that's just sort of a little bit amorphous and based on a label and stuff like that but looking for yourself is is it that like i'm really not comfortable seeing my partner be affectionate with anyone else and like that's just something i will remove myself from that situation so i'm not going to hang out with you guys if you do that that's a good example of a boundary that that you might have uh but so i would just question a little bit what do you mean by boundaries and then two is maintaining this meaningful established friendship is hang out with them on your own too, you know, kind Mm -hmm. of be clear about, I want to maintain this friendship and I don't always want to have to do that while we're together in this way, or, you know, Hey, I'd love for us to all still be friends. Could we do it and just not have anyone touch each other during that or (laughs) something, right? Just like be clear and, and negotiate that and see what you can come up with. And hopefully both your partner and your friend are friends with you and are willing to be like, yeah, let's make this work. Let's let's find a way to do this so everyone feels comfortable. All right. And our last question for today is, I feel compersion when my nesting partner tells me about her sexual experiences with others, past and present. In fact, it is sexually stimulating for me. I do not, however, feel compersion when it comes to her having emotional, meaningful connections with others. Why is it easy for me to be okay with her sexual escapades, but not her emotional connections with others? I want to hear a quick poll of the other podcast hosts. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious to hear all y'all's experience with this. Of, I mean, not that it's a strict binary between sexual compersion or emotional compersion. But I'm, yeah, I'm curious about where you tend to land on this, what your past experiences have been. I would say, yeah, I probably fall in a similar realm. Like, I don't know, Mm. sex is fine to, I'm not sure exactly that I necessarily get turned on, although I definitely have hearing about the sexual escapades of others and participating in them in addition to (laughs) and getting to watch. But um, in terms of emotional, yeah, I think that cuts deeper in some ways, although I felt compersion for those times as well. But sometimes, yeah, that gets a little bit more irky, like 
squeaky. Uh, I don't know how I feel squeaky. about this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to like onomatopoeia it somehow. Yeah. Like yeah, so that exactly. noise that you just made. The, uh, 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 yeah. yeah, squeaky. Gotcha. Yeah, when I hear about emotional connections, and I've definitely downplayed my own, and probably had partners downplay their retellings of the emotional connections that they have with others just because that can be difficult. Right. Yeah. It's funny. I think for me, I'm the opposite of Emily and oh, yeah? of this question asker that I'm, I think I'm more comfortable hearing about, you know, and, and feeling good about my partner having emotional connections mm. and being like, Oh yeah, this is great. And feels really rewarding. And, and the sexual stuff, I'm just sort of like, yeah, Cool, good for you. I don't really want to think about that or, mm. or hear that. Interesting. That, and that, I'm, I'm just as I'm thinking back, I'm like, that's not always true. I can think of exceptions to both of those, but I would say if I tended to fall on one side, it would more often be that way. Yeah, I think I'm the same. It, oh, it, really? The funny thing, though, I'm realizing that when I think about a partner or partners having sex with other people, sometimes that can turn me on, like the fantasy portion of it, mm. where of course it's oh, my own brain okay. and I control everything, right? That sometimes <laughs> sure. that can be really hot. But then the reality is like, I, I don't know. No, I don't necessarily want to hear about it. Um, I, this also gets complicated because of course, like if your partner is coming home and divulging all this private information about like what this person's genitals looked like, mm. uh, then, then, then it gets tricky of like, well, is that person you slept with? Okay. With you telling me those things, maybe they are, maybe they're not, I don't know. So I think that does complicate it a little bit, but then right. when I think about hearing about a partner's emotional developments or emotional connections, that kind of depends on the context. I, I do think that if, there's some insecurity there, either insecurity within myself or insecurity with the stability of the relationship that can be more challenging to hear, right? Sure. Like if there's something mm. emotional that I've been craving from my partner and then I feel like they're giving it to someone else, that can be really hard to hear. But then I've also had experiences where if I know that there's something a partner's really struggled with, with like finding intimacy or finding acceptance or safety, and then they find that with somebody, then it's really easy for me to feel really joyful mm. and happy for mm. them. So for me, it feels like a little bit across the board. And with, and this person is asking why, why is it easy for me to be okay with these <laughs> I, things? I don't know. And without, yeah. Without being able to like yeah. sit down and, and do a little inventory of your whole relationship history and psychology, it's, it's yeah. hard to answer that specific question. But that's why I thought maybe it'd be helpful if we shared just our own individual experiences because it varies a lot. Yeah, I, I think yeah. as another angle to look at what Dedeker was just talking about, where it's about, you know, what I see my partner, you know, struggling with or that I'm jealous of or things like that. I think on the other side, there could be also where do you feel confident? If it's like, mm. well, I feel confident that sex with me is good, but like part of me is not so sure that emotionally being in a relationship with me is as good, you know, and this is mm -hmm. most likely mm -hmm. totally unfounded, right? Cause we've all got our baggage and our insecurities and things like that. But I know that, that if you have more of an insecurity in one area than the other, it's going to be harder to feel that compersion because there's more threat there. It's more of this like, Oh, but if they're getting something good in this area, then like, then they won't want it from me anymore. Cause I'm not good. Yeah, or or maybe I'm not good. I don't know if I'm good or not. Right? <laughs> like, kind of however that shows up for you. I think that's definitely a factor that could be at play here too. My partner once dated someone who they like shared poetry and stuff, and would send you know their favorite mm. poems back and forth to each other. And my partner writes poetry sometimes, and you know enjoyed doing that. And that definitely made me feel like. Ugh! I don't do that. Oh, so icky squeaky. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. But that was like icky squeaky at times. Yeah. No, I get Whereas, that. you know, whatever, like go nuts in terms yeah. of sex. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> fun. Yeah. So I, I don't know. But yeah, that, that tracks though, in terms of where the two of you would feel, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. emotionally mm -hmm. excited versus not that you two aren't outrageously attractive people. <laughs> Goodness. Well, thank you, Emily. <laughs> but yeah, I was going to, I was going to say though, another piece to this is um, that this could 
change over time in that relationship too, and could be different in different relationships. Like you may experience at some point that in this relationship, I have an easier time feeling compersion with them about sex or maybe a specific type of sex. It's like, I have total easy time having compersion for them having their like BDSM scenes, but like a harder time if they're having like this really, you know, intimate romantic kind of sex. Mm -hmm. And then maybe with another partner, it's the opposite or another partner. I'm, I'm just not as into hearing about the sex they're having. You know, it could also vary based on the level of confidence you have in that relationship and kind of the level of comfort in that relationship. Like to go with Emily's example, if, you know, eight years ago, Dedeker had started dating someone who like had all of the poems of Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman memorized oh or something. Whoa. I would have Whoa. been super threatened, Dedek- right? She's even, Dedeker's she's getting all like, hot and bothered right now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just thinking about tell. it. I would have been super threatened by that back then. And, you know, now after just a lot more years together. I, 20 I, million years. Y'all yeah, are like, I think, yeah, I, whatever. Could have, I, think I could have more compersion for that and kind of be like, well, that's cool. You have someone to do that with. And, and like, that's, so, that's so, okay. Great, so but... if I had dated Walt Whitman eight years ago, cause I think that's probably maybe one of the few people who would know who all, of, all his poems poems of Walt Whitman. Heart. Heart. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Sure. Sure. <laughs> well, huh. good to hear from you. Sexually compersive and, South Carolina. <laughs> okay, SC and SC. See, That's if people fun. don't include their That's own fun, yeah. monikers, I'm going so to give them to them. you. I love mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. That's great. <laughs> That's beautiful. All yeah. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your question, and we hope that that was helpful. Getting some, some, just some thoughts about where that may be coming from, and that that can encourage your own introspection about where that's coming from, and. We would also love to hear from all of you at home. We're going to be posting our question of the week on our Instagram. And the question is, where have you met your friends with benefits? Or what's a great place to meet friends with benefits in your experience? We would love to hear from you because I know that that's a hard thing. And whenever people ask us this, we don't have a good answer. So we would love for everyone to be able to share some of their uh, options and, and ways that they've made those sorts of connections. Also, the best way to share your thoughts with other listeners is in the episode discussion channel on our Discord server, or you can post in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Matlack, Dedeker Winston, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowark and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com.